you guys have now. These, these lecture halls are so different now It would look like an elementary school when I went here, which is not a knock on it, it was great. But this room even exists. It's a really good elementary school. It was a really good it was a very nice elementary school. Yes, this room Yeah, this room existed but it wasn't this nice. Okay. Uh, nothing here was this nice. Um, we had a you'd go downstairs, there was a place where you could buy a bagel and maybe a, a bottle of water and a soda or something. That was about it. Yeah. So you have to leave, leave to get anything you wanted to eat. Um, but it's pretty cool now. When's the last time you were here? To the law school? Uh, well, it's a visit. Uh, oh, we, we dropped our daughter off. We got a freshman here. Oh, okay. And uh, dropped her off, what was that, October? late September, or early September. How's she liking it here? She loves it. She loves it. Can't get enough of it. I made dr the drop-off process, the moving-in process is a lot different than I remembered it. These, all these students, uh, just, uh, just sand. Yeah, I mean they, they attacked the car. Everything was out of it, and she was in her room in like two minutes. And uh, any autograph requests during that? They were too busy. Okay. I mean, I tried to tip them, and they wouldn't take it. That's ramble. Yeah, it was it was awesome. I mean, it was tremendous. And then we spent the rest of the day just kind of watching her unpack all her stuff, but we didn't. I didn't have to carry one thing. Yeah. It was the best thing ever. Oh, so student volunteers do it. Yeah, like the uh, FAC, like the Faculty Advisory Council or something. All those students. That's nice. I guess they they band together and they go to yeah. dorm after dorm after dorm on East Campus and move everybody in. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm told this happens at a number of campuses now. I've never seen it before, but it was. It was a nice perk. Glad to hear she likes it here so far. She loves it. Yeah, yeah. It's been a great time. All right, well, I'm going to get us started pretty much right now if you guys are ready. Anytime like, you say. A really brief intro, and then I'll just pass it off to the professor again. Um, all right, we're going to get started. Oh, louder than I thought. OK. Um, all right, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Abe Benavides. I'm the co-president of the Sports and Entertainment Law Society here at Duke Law. Uh, welcome to, today, to today's discussion on amateurism in college sports with Jay Billis and Professor Paul Hagen. Uh, Professor Paul Hagen has taught at Duke Law since 1985. He has studied at Haverford College, Princeton, Yale, and Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He has also clerked on the United States Court of Appeals. He has chaired Duke's Academic Council in the past and currently serves as the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at Duke Law. He also teaches contracts to first-year law students and sports law to second- and third-year law students. Most of you know Jay Billis from his work as a college basketball analyst on ESPN. Um, a lot of you also know him from his time playing at Duke and playing basketball for Coach K from 1983 to 1986, helping lead Duke to the Final Four and Championship game in 86. He returned to Duke to serve as an assistant to Coach K in, in getting his JD in 1992. Um, and currently, in addition to his work at ESPN, he serves as of counsel at Moore and Van Allen in Charlotte. Um, today's discussion, like I mentioned, was about amateurism in college sports. Uh, the debate about student athlete compensation has been around for a long time, but has really hit a zeitgeist, if you will, in the past year. Uh, the NCAA is embroiled in lawsuits on a variety of fronts. Uh, regarding student athlete likeness in video games, merchandise, on television, and there's also a wave of, concussion, of lawsuits on the concussion front, um, similar to the, what the NFL went through recently. Um, the issue has garnered significant national attention, to say the least. The fact that Johnny Manziel was on the cover of Time Magazine with the headline, It's Time to Pay College Athletes, uh, in September, says it all right there. Um, Mr. Billis has undoubtedly raised the profile of this very issue. In early August, he brought to light the fact that the NCAA, the NCAA website would bring up Johnny Manziel's number two A&M jersey if you search his name on the website, in addition to a variety of other high-profile players. Um, 
about a month later, Time Magazine ran their Johnny Manziel feature, and since at that point the NCAA had apologized and reconfigured their website for bringing up names of student athletes. So there was clearly a link there. We are thrilled to have both Mr. Billis and Professor Hagen here today for this important discussion. Please join me in welcoming them today. Thank you. Today I want to start out with um, a little memory time here. Uh, about, I think it was about 15 years ago, you and I were on one of these panels, and you asked a really perceptive question uh, to the uh, proposal that student athletes should be paid uh, something. I think at that time the proposal was about $2,000. And you said, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And that was clearly a regulatory problem. What is the problem we're trying to solve now? Well, the problem I'm trying to solve is one of, of what I consider to be a, a fundamental fairness and of policy. And it's, it's really interesting. Well, two interesting things. First of all, thank you for coming and thank you for having me here. And Abe uh, and Professor Hagen, thanks for, for inviting me. Uh, I, I always enjoy the listing of the credentials, you know, Professor Hagen, clerk of the Supreme Court, and the Rhodes Scholar, and then they say, and he barely got, Jay barely got his JD here. <laughs> He's now of counsel, which means he doesn't do anything of value anymore. <laughs> um, but for me, I, I mean, it's taken on this odd, uh, you know, role for me now that I'm, I'm termed, you know, NCAA critic. And uh, uh, that I'm I'm somehow opposite the NCAA. When um, the truth is, I really like the NCAA. I think it's a, in its proper role. It is a it's a wonderful association. Uh, it's an athletic association that is should be, in my judgment, charged with administering championships and serving the athletic needs uh, of the um, of the membership in in pursuing those championships. I think it gets out of its lane a lot. Uh, there are a lot of people who have the perception that somehow I don't like the NCAA or I don't like the people at the NCAA, which is not at all the case. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are NCAA people. Um, or used to. Yeah, I used to. <laughs> but I really, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny how often um, I get together with, with folks who work in the Indianapolis office that will, will say, who are great people. I mean, there's a difference between the policy and the people. I, I don't agree with the policies. I think the people are phenomenal. And, and now, are there exceptions? There are exceptions in every business where some people aren't great. Their, their people, by and large, are great. And more often than not, I'll hear from, I'll, I'll be talking with, with folks from the NCAA and they'll say, we agree with you more than you think. Now, maybe the entire association, their policies don't agree with, with mine or, or don't, don't sort of go down the same path as mine. But to get back to your original question, I, I think the policies behind the, the principle of amateurism that the NCAA holds out are wrong. I think we are running a professional uh, sport, uh, sports organization. Uh, I think Duke is running a professional sports organization, and every other uh, institution in big-time athletics is doing that. And I don't feel that it's fair or right or justifiable as a policy that only one class of person is restricted to their expenses only and nothing more. And I, I have yet to hear a, a, a good justification uh, for that policy. <laughs> And, uh, and But what I do here are mostly what I consider to be excuses. We don't have enough money. Title IX can't do it. Um, it's antithetical to what college athletics is all about. Uh, all these other sports would go away. Um, every burden that you know, or sacrifice is on the athlete and the athlete alone. Um, Jim Delaney, the, the, the uh, commissioner of the Big Ten, recently came out and basically said, um, if you don't like it, go to the D-League or go overseas or go pro. You know, nobody, kind of the idea that the standard response of nobody's holding a gun to your head, even though we live in a society that encourages everybody to go to college. Um, or, and hold a gun to your head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's held at one, one point or another. Um, 
And then he said something that I thought was really interesting. And Jim is a good friend and an incredibly smart man, and I think one of the smartest people in college athletics. But he said that college athletics essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but it's built up a brand over 100 years. And that brand has value that the players shouldn't necessarily be able to realize. But it struck me as odd that, well, everybody else gets to realize their value, their fair market value, without a discount for the brand. Um, you know, Jim makes a lot of money. I don't know whether he makes $2 million or whatever it is, but it's, oh, it's well over a million dollars. And there's no brand discount, like, hey, man, you, we had a good brand before you got here. Nobody says that. And nobody's telling Coach K he's got to give a brand, you know, brand discount for, for his. He's, he's valued. And nobody says, what would you be worth in the D-League? Because that, that's what we say to players. Well, go out in the open market see what you're worth. Well, we're looking at a comparison market because we've closed this one. And then we tell them they're not worth anything when we know the truth is that they're worth a tremendous amount. And, you know, Abe brought up this, um, this thing that happened with that NCAA website, which was really interesting and totally unintended. Uh, I had been alerted that there was a jersey being sold there that said uh, number two, Texas A&M on the front, and number two, and football, where the name goes on the back. And I, I thought, man, that is pretty brazen because it's always been sort of the, the stance of, of the NCAA and the member institutions that those jerseys represent the school, it's not the player, even though it just happens to be the best player's number every time. Um, but it's, it's that, that's the school, you know, and okay. Well, and I don't, honestly don't remember exactly how this came up, but you put, you know, you search the name in the, in the search box and the jersey comes up. And I started doing it over and over again with all these different names. It really tested my knowledge of college football. And Taj Boyd, boom, number 10, Clemson. You know, Jadavian Clowney, boom, number 7, South Carolina. And I took screen grabs so that they, they couldn't change it, and I started making fun of it and sort of... Because really, the, the, the things that the NCAA has always responded to, that they respond to, are, is ridicule. They don't like to be ridiculed. And I don't like to be ridiculed either. But, but they kind of invite it at times and uh, with some of the policies and some of the you know, so-called justifications for them. And so when this all happened, I thought, I don't know what you thought, but I thought it was a, a, an incredible overreaction on their part. They, sh for, they shut down the, the search capability on the site. And that was essentially blood in the water for media because they took that as an admission of wrongdoing. So now all the media get involved, and then the NCAA jumped in and said, after that, we're not doing this anymore. We're not going to sell it. Well, to me, that's a, they're not doing anything because the office in Indianapolis will say, when there's criticism, wait a minute, the NCAA is the member institutions. It's not us. It's the member institutions. Okay. Well, if it's the member institutions, the member institutions are still selling all this stuff. And they also, I think, miss what has always been my point, is it's not just the jerseys. The jerseys are the easy thing to spot because you put a number on it. That's the, that's, that's the easy thing. The players have value in every T-shirt, every banner, everything that's sold uh, in, in this $4.6 billion merchandising industry. They have value in all of it. And it's not to say that the schools don't have value. The schools do. They have tremendous value, but so do the players. And we've created a system where the players aren't allowed to realize that value. And we, instead of having a, a, what I would call a policy justification for it that makes sense, we make excuses. And, you know, if amateurism, if, if the policy is so good and wonderful, they should be able to justify it pretty easily. And we can't seem to do it. We keep coming up with this thing about we don't have enough money. So few of the athletic departments make money as if that keeps them from paying everybody else. That's, to me, that's not good enough. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Title IX. Okay, well, Title IX is a, an important piece of federal legislation that's been very, very good. It hasn't stopped us from building buildings. We build a lot of buildings, and we comply with Title IX. You know, if that's not a good enough reason. Well, allow the players to be compensated and comply with Title IX at the same time. Uh, and they certainly can't be saying what I hope they're not saying, which is, uh oh, -uh, we don't want to pay women. Like, they can't be saying that. But it sounds like that sometimes. Well, geez, we have to pay women, too. Well, okay. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be objecting to that, can you? Um, I don't think they mean to be saying that, but the implication is that. 
And, and the implication is that the players just aren't worth anything. Okay. And I don't, I don't think that's true, and I don't think the world would spin off its axis if we allowed them more than a scholarship. And I think there's a lot of room between strict amateurism of expenses only, which is what I consider a scholarship to be an expense that's incidental to a multi-billion dollar business, and this sort of model of pay for play that, that uh, Mark Emmert and, and others in the structure say, well, we don't want pay for play. But then they imply that the scholarship is pay, and it's enough. Um, let's take a, a couple of things. In support of your position, um, uh, originally coaches couldn't be paid. Mm -hmm. Walter Camp worked in the clock factory and then went over and ran Yale's practice for the top team in the country. And Harvard didn't pay until they kept getting beaten every year. And uh, then they started paying, and that's the first paid coach. Um, but, you know, amateurism was no paid coaches, and they get paid now, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, just, I don't know if this group uh, knows what uh, the definition of amateurism is under the NCAA. Does anybody have a... What is an amateur athlete? Somebody who gets paid only as much as the NCAA say they can be paid. <laughs> uh, it, it has no intellectual or normative or moral integrity at all. So if we're going to try to come up with something that had integrity, what, what do you think would do it? Because when you're talking about the players having value, they have different amounts of value, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know. You have a lot more value than the walk-ons and probably less value than Johnny Dawkins. No, probably. <laughs> right. Uh, so w what would you imagine would be the, the way in which we would respond to that? Because one of the things you were, were pointing out to me very powerfully 15 years ago is anything short of the market won't satisfy um, the, the sense of not being appropriately compensated at the stars. And, and that was the reason for the question that I asked in response, which I was told never do as a child, don't answer a question with a question. But um, so sort of, it was a great. Should, should we great should we compensate college athletes, give them the stipend, and you know the what's the problem we're trying to solve? Because they, they at that time it was it was it's presented movie. yeah it was presented as if. That will stop athletes from taking um, what it called improper benefits. And it's only improper because the NCAA says they're improper, kind of to, to your point. Um, you know, a lot of the things that went on years and years ago uh, would be seen as horribly improper now. Um, that just are normal, it's normal human behavior. So I kind of approach it differently that I start with instead of starting where a lot of folks do because of the way we've been conditioned in college athletics, that people say to me all the time, all right, smart guy, show me your plan. What's your plan that's going to pay everybody equally and fairly? Um, and what, Just why would equally be fair? But that's the thing. That would be my response. Okay. But this is what they say. Show me that's going to pay everybody equitably, uh, that's going to satisfy Title IX, that's going to continue with our level playing field, that's not going to uh, reduce other sports, that's not going to do, you know, and they give you, give you that. Okay, smart guy, give me the plan. I said, well, it's right next to the plan that pays everybody else. There isn't one. You know, there's no plan that pays every, where's the plan that pays all the coaches? There's no plan. It's a free market. And we handle it pretty well. The free market is pretty efficient. Now, does that mean that there are coaches that aren't overpaid? Of course not. There are coaches that are overpaid. Does that mean that there are coaches that aren't undervalued? Of course, we have coaches that are undervalued. But the market works itself out pretty well. So I would start from, if you know, I start from the premise, we don't have a good reason or a good policy justification to restrict only athletes in this business. And it's a multi-billion dollar business. So mine would be, let's have a free market system. And if we have legitimate concerns that we need to regulate, we can regulate those. You know, right now we can, we regulate everything. I mean, we regulate stationary, we regulate phone calls, we regulate every, how many times the players eat and what they eat, fruits, nuts, and bagels in the morning. We, we regulate everything. So we could certainly regulate pay. And when they say, well, people are just going to cheat, 
Well, people cheat all the time in everything. That's not a policy justification. Is people will cheat. If, if the NCAA, with that sort of mindset, were running our highway systems, we'd all be driving 10 miles an hour because somebody went, was speeding. You know, that's not a policy justification. So I would go to the, the sort of the free market system, and then we can regulate it from there. Uh, if, like, I, I tend to believe that if we had a free market system for players where talent procurement was, uh, was number one, or we, we, you, could, you could value it anywhere you wanted, that, that we would put less money into these incredible facilities we've got to attract players, and we put it more into the, the procurement of players. And schools would say, we need to protect ourselves, so we need to have a contract. So if we're going to give money to Jabari Parker, who's the, the, the hotshot freshman that Coach Gay's got now, you might want to say, the school might say, we're willing to pay you X to stay here with, along with your, your expenses, to stay here for three years, but we're going to insist upon a non-compete clause. We're going to insist upon a behavior clause. We're going to insist upon a, a clause for your academic performance that we can terminate the contract with cause. If you leave before the stated time, we've got, we've got this non-compete. You cannot play anywhere else. Um, we, all those things could be taken care of the same way it's taken care of with regard to any other person or employee that we deal with. Um, I tend to think that could work. If That's not going to be palatable to a lot of people. They're not going to want that because that's an antithetical to what college athletics is all about, as if there was some sort of, um, you know, Moses brought down what college athletics is all about on a third tablet. Um, you know, none of what's going on is what college athletics is about. And I asked this question on Twitter recently uh, just to see what kind of response I'd get, and, it was, and the question was, what do you call a professional athlete enrolled in a college course? A student. What, 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 does it have to, what does it have to do with a, a, a person's status as a student, whether they're paid or not? Because we've got professional athletes and paid professionals in other endeavors sitting in classes all over the country right now. Professional baseball players are sitting in college classes playing college football and college basketball right now. And nobody's storming the offices in Indianapolis or the NCAA with torches and pitchforks going, this, this contagion cannot get near our amateurs. It's legal, and nobody cares. Nobody cheered for Kyle Parker any less at, at uh, Clemson because he was a professional athlete while he played college football. Or Trajan Langdon. Or Trajan Langdon here. Um, it, they're, they're, it's, it's not this awful thing, but we've got it in our heads that, um, and I hear this a lot, and I, I'm, I'm very respectful of it because, look, scholarship's great. I mean, I've got a daughter in college now. I would love her to be on scholarship. But when people say, you know, kind of, you get a lot of, well, screw them. I paid for school. Why should, you know, I, I carry debt out. Why should, why should they not have it? Um, I mean, I get that feeling, but that's, is, really? Is that the argument that's going to carry the day that, you know, I pay a lot to play golf, you know? It doesn't mean Tiger Woods shouldn't make money. It doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me. And, would the, you know, do we really think that, that it would have this such a negative impact on our, our, our integrity if the players had money. Uh, I don't think it would, and I think we would be a lot better off. Um, we'd be, there would be less contradictions. I still hesitate to say hypocrisy. Um, I, that, that just is such an inflammatory word, but we're getting, we're getting there where I'm going to start saying it because we're, we're in hypocritical territory. And uh, I, I've always said that there are, there are so many contradictions but hypocrisy is around the corner uh, because we've got billions involved here, and and boy, if the athlete takes a sandwich, then we got a problem, and I don't see that as being a problem. Now, um, you said we could regulate, and two two at least uh, potential serious challenges. Uh, in the only um, professional league where there isn't some kind of control on salary. EPL. Um, uh, things have gotten really out of control, and the league is in constant danger of financial instability. Um, what, what would protect schools from paying way too much and destabilizing the entire system? How would you prevent that kind of, of thing? And you, you suggested regulation. 
but uh, if this gets us to the word we used at the beginning, uh, those regulations are going to be antitrust violations. Yes. I mean, if you're going to, if we wanted to try to regulate pay, which we've tried to do in the past with restricted yeah, earnings coaches, to pick up who was a colleague of mine here at Duke and a coach of mine, then we wound up working together. At, at one time, there was a, a position on a staff called the restricted earnings coach, and it was designed uh, to allow actually guys like me at the time to get a foot in the door in coaching and work their way up. It was kind of like a graduate assistant. You, you had a graduate assistant and this restricted earnings coach. And I think it was 15 grand. Uh, was yeah, no, no, it was 20, 20, 28. 28. Yeah. So it, was, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of money. And so coaches would rotate their staff through the position. They sued and antitrust, and they won a bunch. Of, I don't even remember what the, the money was. But so the NCAA's had experience with trying to regulate pay. Could you regulate, see, I'm not talking about regulating pay as much as I am. Could you say if uh, uh, the amount of pay, but you, could you say, look, in our amateurism definition, um, to keep the, what, what everybody says would be the, the doomsday scenario. Let's say we went to the, uh, let's go somewhere in the middle, say we went to the Olympic model, which I've advocated as, as a pretty good compromise uh, uh, between the free market and the current you know, sort of semi-plantation system. And that is, that is uh, the schools wouldn't pay. It would be the same amateurism model on the part of the schools, but the players could seek value outside of the school um, if, uh, if they wanted to do a commercial for a local car company or something like that. Well, the immediate doomsday scenario is brought out by an opponent of that saying, well, if you did that, Go like. Phil, Knight would just, um, Phil Knight would just pay everybody a million dollars to do a commercial for Nike. Uh, ignoring the fact that that's a publicly traded company and the shareholders never stand for that. But, um, you know, right now players can work. You know, they can hold jobs. So Phil Knight could hire all the Oregon players to come over and mow his lawn for a million dollars. Well, we can regulate that. We could regulate the amount of money that's paid to a player by saying it's got to be within reason of a fair market value deal via contract, a legitimate business deal via contract. We can come up with the terms of, of sort of that kind of regulation and make sure that it's not some, you know, sort of the doomsday T. Boone Pickens is going to just pay every great player to come to Oklahoma State. And when, and I've always found it kind of curious when that T. Boone Pickens and, and Phil Knight are the names invoked most often in that because they're, you know, they have their allegiances with their particular schools. and. And this is going to sound disrespectful to the coaches, and I don't mean it to be, but T. Boone Pickens right now can give whatever amount of money to hire a coach. Do it right now. Give $100 million. Give, you know, if he wants Nick Saban, give $100 million to see if he can get him. He's not doing it. I don't think it, it would be the kind of doomsday scenario that we're worried about, uh, and I don't think it would be that different than what we've got now. Um, because people still can, if the argument that the rules could be circumvented was a winner, we wouldn't have any rules because all the rules can be circumvented now. Um, you know, there may be peanut butter being provided on bagels as we speak. <laughs> Another rule being violated. Um, what, what about the possibility of um, having a salary cap for the athletic department? So the AD, the coaches, the players are all in the pot, and the coach could get Jabari Parker if he wants to take a pick. If he wants to take less. Um, I mean, I, you know, I haven't thought of every different scenario. I think that would, there are so many things that could be workable that are within the range of free market and zero. Or at um, least could expose uh, contradictions. Right, the, exactly, <laughs> the contradictions in the system. And, you know, my 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 stance is more a policy one because I don't have I haven't sat down and said okay here's the because I think it would be a waste of my time to do it because nobody would take it you know it's not like the NCAA would take you know if I wrote an article for ESPN about here's the system that would work it's not like Mark Emmer's going to take it into a meeting and say come on let's get this in, in motion it's kind of a waste of time because until until we at least I think it is until we sort of wrap our heads around, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Like last year, I'm, I, I watch pro football like most of us do, and I love it. I mean, I'm a big NFL fan. So uh, last year when the 
the officials were out uh, on when they struck. I think it was a strike. They weren't locked out, were they? Is that a lockout or strike? Uh, I think they were locked out. Too. Okay, they, they were locked out. But the officials are officials are out. Uh, so a lockout. Um, and it started affecting the product. I didn't care whether the officials got their pensions. I really didn't. I mean, I'm a nice guy, and I have a lot of compassion for a lot of people, but I wanted to watch football games. And so when they got it all worked out, um, I wasn't going over the fine details of did they get what they wanted because it was that would be so unfair if they had to run up and down and you know throw flags without full coverage and that would be horrible. I wanted football, <laughs> and and I think I I believe that most fans of college sports uh, want the games that they may have a, a romantic notion about what college is all about and what college sports are all about to them, and it usually extends only to their school. Um, but the truth is they just want their games. That's why they don't like conference realignment. It interrupts our games. Uh, I don't think they would care if the players are paid as long as they get their games, uh, as long as the tournament isn't changed. As long, you know, they, 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 people like certainty and they like the product, and that's all great. But do I think that, that we would have a, a huge problem if the players were paid and fans would stop watching? I don't. I don't believe that for one second. Because the same, you know, the same arguments would be made as to coaches' salaries years and years ago. If you said that coaches were going to make five, ten million dollars a year, people would have said, "Well, I'll stop watching," and they're still watching, um, and they still they still enjoy it. I don't think that has anything to do with it. Um, if you were advising the president of an institution, at what point would you tell him it's time to get off this? Time to get off of, of what? Uh, of the train of um, high-level intercollegiate athletics. I don't. I wouldn't. Um, I think there are certain institutions that are, that have to make that decision um, that are, are further down the, the trough, if you will. Um, I think Butler is a wonderful example of what college athletics sort of has become and has become about. And that is, it, it, college athletics is used for a lot of different things. It's, first of all, it's great. I mean, it's wonderful for the players. It's wonderful for the, 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 the fans. It's a great product. Um, so it's a, it's a vehicle to make money. It's, we can sit and argue about how much educational value there is in it. I mean, I think there's some. I don't think it's what the NCAA claims it is. Um, but it's great. Uh, but Butler, when they went to the, the championship game in 2010 and, and played Duke, and then 2011 played UConn. The narrative was, boy, they got it figured out. I mean, that's awesome. You know, that, that, that's the true student athlete. They're, they're in it for the right reasons. You know, they're not about money. They play in Hinkle Fieldhouse, and uh, that's where, you know, they measured the basket and did Hoosiers, and Brad Stevens isn't there for the money. He left Eli Lilly, and, uh, and they're in the Horizon League. They get it. Okay, well, two years later, they're in the Big East, and Brad Stevens is coaching the Celtics. <laughs> they like money, too. <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with that, because Brad Stevens is just as great a guy now as he was two years ago. And Butler is still a great school, and it, as it was two years ago. But not only people can be fooled. Like, this was, this was not only for money, but it was for institutional advancement that Butler wants to get their enrollment up and they want to become a more selective institution. They want to rise up and, the, you know, let's not pretend like, you know, U.S. News and World Report rankings aren't important to people. They're important. And everybody wants to rise up in that. And a lot of schools use athletics for institutional advancement. Uh, it provides them the ability to get more money in, get more people interested, get more uh, exposure, um, it, it become a hot school. Remember when... Uh, uh, it was 86 when we uh, I do, go absolutely. We go to the Final Four and then we're on the New York Times Magazine, Hot Colleges. It's Ted Duke right now in front of the, the chapel. And the you know, director of institutional advancement uh, ran into the, um, uh, the uh, Duke store and was going around campus giving kids uh, sweatshirts. Oh, for the picture? For the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. That's great. <laughs> Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What, what I think is wrong is that, we're, that we are intentionally and industry-wide cutting the players off from realizing, uh, realizing their value at a time when their value couldn't be any higher. 
Now, some are going to go on to professional careers and make a ton of money, but others have value while they're in college. All of them have value while they're in college. And if we really believe what Jim Delaney said or what some others have said, that the athletes don't have value without the, uh, the enterprise itself, then why are we trying to restrict it? We know they have value, and we know it's going to cost us some money. That's why we're restricting it. And you know, this, all this other business about, well, we're trying to protect them against themselves, and what are they going to do with the money? And um, I don't buy any of that stuff. Those are all what I would term excuses and rationalizations. And I, I still have yet to, like, if I, were, if I were in charge of PR for the NCAA, I would tell them, quit making excuses and just rely on the least ridiculous of your claims, and that's amateurism. Because if you just said, if somebody said, why don't you pay the player? We believe in amateurs. You don't have to get into we don't have enough money. You don't have to get into Title IX. You don't have to get into all these other things. We believe in amateurism. Now we can argue about, you know, holding, you know, that amateurism is just that the, the elite don't want to compete against the common man and all that stuff. We can have that argument, but most people don't care about that. But if they just stuck with one thing, even though I think it's a ridiculous argument, um, it's better than all the other ones combined, and they keep getting into the weeds of arguing the other things, and are they have you know, kind of the pay for play thing? Well, we don't want we don't want pay for play, and then in the next sentence, somebody will say, "Well, they're already paid; they get a scholarship." Well, so you're admitting it already is pay for play, and we're just arguing over the amount. Then um, you know, it's, it's someone so much of it kind of falls down in my judgment, but it's a it's a bad a bad place. Now. Um, I, I, why do you think there has been a just sea change in attitude? Because, again, um, when the O'Bannon case started, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the parts of it are IP, uh, but the rest of it uh, is really turning on antitrust defenses, <laughs> where the NCAA is won every time. Uh, and they went into that case thinking they were going to get a motion to dismiss and it would be over. Um, they've now got a population across the country that are questioning all of the basic tenants. Do you have any account for why that happened? And I think it's, it's happened fast. Yeah, I think it's just been a perfect storm of... of you? I mean, I, sadly, I think I've played a little bit of a role in it because of that, that uh, Jersey business. Yeah. Um, and I do think, and, and you know, I don't, I'll give the NCAA what I think their playbook should be anytime they want it. Um, that was incredibly stupid of them to shut down the search engine and then shut the thing down the next day. That was a, an admission that they were, what they're doing is wrong. They know it's wrong. And you can't with a straight face claim that we're not selling the players when you're selling the players on your own site. And now they are getting into hypocrisy because they're saying, uh, well, we're not doing this anymore. When their member schools are doing it, and you know they can they can tell me that hey we're trying to take the lead on this. We hope our member schools will follow. Uh, they're not following. And even if and this is a, probably going to happen at some point, the the all the commissioners will get together and say look, and the president say we need to stop selling these jerseys because it's it's taken our the focus off of it's making us look bad and it's really not enough money. Because we can just sell T-shirts and still make 4.5 billion, so let's get the jerseys out and we'll get this argument off the table. That's probably a smart move on their part, uh, and and sticking with the amateurism thing. But I do think it's been a perfect storm of the amount of money keeps going up. This conference realignment stuff really made everybody examine uh, how much money there was. The fact that we're we're talking about you know the, and, and and the commitment the of the schools to yes. tradition. Yes. The greed became an issue, um, uh, that, that these things were being done for money, and it was okay to do it for money. You know, Maryland leaving and doing all these different things, uh, uh, all, the, all the different realignment issues. Now people start saying, wait a minute, this is, this is a naked money grab. What? There's money in sports? You're kidding. Uh, so it, it, it made even the average Joe say, hey, wait a minute. Um, and then... I do think that, that as difficult a job as the president of the NCAA is, and it is a difficult job, um, the PR... But they get paid a lot. They get paid a lot of money. He makes at least, uh, Mark Emmert makes at least $1.7 at least, and I think it's more than that. 
But I, I applaud that. Everybody make as much as they want, but don't, don't tell the players they can't have any now. If, if, it's, if it's free market for everybody else and the players, then I got a problem with it. But I don't think the PR of this has been handled very well. And, uh, and I, I think the rhetoric, the NCAA's rhetoric is um, sanctimonious. And, uh, and I think people are starting to see that. And I do believe the, the one thing I've always wanted in, in my comments about this, like it would be easier for me, I don't deserve any credit for this, but it would be easier for me to just sit back and take my paycheck and, and sell the games and go home. But you know, I, I've always been interested in the policy since I was a, a player. I was an, on the NCAA Long Range Planning Committee when I was a player. And I would go to these meetings and listen to some of this stuff, and I just didn't agree with it. I can't tell you that I thought we should have been paid back then because I wasn't thinking that, but I hated the transfer rule. I, uh, if I had gone to another school that I was looking at, and, and I'm glad I came where I did because of who I played for and where I got to go to school, but um, if, I had gone, if I had been an idiot and gone somewhere else, um, I, the coach at one of the other places I looked at, my final three schools, left after my freshman, what would have been my freshman year. So I would have been stuck there, unable to leave. I would have had to sit a year out. And well, that, that's because we know that you're going for the institution and not the That's coach. what they said. That's exactly what was shot back at me. And, and I, was, I was dismissed out of hand so quickly. And it wasn't the reality of what I was looking at on the ground. And, and so that really made me start to question everything that, that, wait a minute, that story you just told is not true. That is not what's happening. And um, uh, so it's, it started getting me questioning things. And, and I've questioned it ever since. I've, I can't tell you that 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I was, because I've thought about it a lot. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, I'm right and everybody else, is, of course, I think my view is right. But, uh, you know, I accept that there are reasonable alternative views. But I do think that the, you know, the one thing I hope that, that, from what I've said, may be accomplished is that people who wouldn't have thought about this otherwise are going to give it some thought, and that maybe you know maybe we'll we'll come up with some solution. And I'm not even sure it needs a solution as much as it needs just let's get rid of these unfair rules and get it to fair, and uh, and we can work from there. Um, but the more I listen, I, I, I mean, I always ask people, well, tell me what why you think this policy is justified. And they list the, the sort of the excuses or rationalizations we talk about without, well, shouldn't it, those are reasons we can't do, why, why do we want this? Why do we want it like this? And I still haven't heard a good one yet. If any of you have got a good one, let me know. Um, do you want to I would love see to see if we get a yeah. discussion? Yes. The gentleman in the back. <laughs> what we Where I used to sit. <laughs> Uh, when we're talking about play, paying athletes, we're mainly focusing on basketball and football players at, you know, premier institutions, most likely men as well. How would this affect the overall um, athletic budgets for schools and maybe smaller schools, particularly with sports that don't have the revenue, such as swimming, track and field, which, and uh, women's sports in that sense? Um, I don't know where would they still be able to compensate and have these programs, which I still think would have value added to the university and student population. The question was, um, you know, how would this affect essentially the non-revenue sports that have value to the institution, uh, where the, the the athletes in those sports may not have the same value as the the, the athletes in the revenue-producing sports that are higher profile, higher profile institutions. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but the, the problem I see is that this, this entire system, that comes down to me what I call um, another rationalization, is that we're using the system that we've set up as a barrier to providing what we would otherwise freely provide. Like we're kind of saying, we're kind of implying, geez, if it weren't for the fact that other sports would be negatively affected, we would pay you. Or we, we would we would take away this restriction from providing you more. But listen, we've set up these, this system where football and basketball pay for everything else, including all of our salaries. Um, so we can, we just can't do it. Thanks for trying, though. Um, I don't consider that to be a good reason. Um, I think if these sports, as you mentioned, if if these non-revenue sports, what we've termed as non-revenue sports, if they have value to the university, the university should pay for it. It shouldn't be up to football and basketball to pay for all this. 
And that's another thing where I feel like the, the entire burden is on the athlete in, all, in, this, entire, in this entire discussion. It's the athlete that, that has the, the burden of sacrifice and of explaining things and of making a choice that Jim Delaney said, if you don't like it, go to the D-League or go, go to Europe, okay? Nobody says, hey, Jim, if you don't like it, why don't you go be the commissioner of the Illinois High School Federation? Or why don't you go be the, the commissioner of the D-League and see how much money you make? You know, it's just on the athlete. That's just the athlete's choice. You know, if you don't like it, pound sand and go over to Europe. Who else do we invite to leave the country? You know, we're not inviting anybody else to leave the country. We're not saying, well, well what would that kid be worth if he were in the D-League? That's right. Jabari Parker would be worth less in the D-League than he is at Duke because the D-League doesn't make billions of dollars like, the, like college basketball does. But what would Coach K make if we said, well, you go to the D-League? He'd make less. He'd make less. Because the D-League's a different, we're always comparing it for the athlete, but everybody else gets their fair market value just looking at this one endeavor. And the athlete is the one that has to, has to bear the burden of, look, football and basketball are paying for all this, so sorry we can't pay you, but we can pay the coaches whatever we want, we can build these facilities and we can do all this and wind up with zero uh, and, and claim that we're not making any money. Um, I, don't, I don't find that particularly persuasive. My thing would be, because I think we'd find the money if we thought it was really important. Now, w would it mean that some of these, we wouldn't, at Duke or some of these other schools, wouldn't carry 27 varsity sports? It may mean that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the right answer. But I do, I do believe that that's not a good enough reason to restrict everybody to a scholarship only. That I, that I, I think we should make, each institution should have to make those decisions for itself. Uh, and, and let the chips kind of fall where they may on that. Yes, sir, in the back. So did you get the same response? Instead of whose question, I rephrased it and said, instead of getting rid of track and field, you're getting rid of chemistry? You know, if, if, I mean, if you have a small institution that says, we need to get Seventh Woods, we're going to give him a $100 million contract to come play basketball for us in exchange, we no longer have a science department. I mean, a school theoretically make that choice if they value their basketball program over their science department. Okay. Right. Time for a historical thing. Uh, Harvard built the first permanent stadium in the United States and reduced the salaries of all junior faculty. <laughs> but the, the, the question was essentially uh, along the same lines that would you feel the same way if, if a hundred million dollar contract were offered to a player and the chemistry department went away? Um, one, I don't, I don't anticipate that happening. I look at that as kind of a doomsday scenario that, that we go to the sort of the, the, the doomsday thing to say, well, that's why we can't do it. Um, but if Duke doesn't want chemistry, I think the large brains in the Allen building can figure out what they need and what they don't need. And I think that's a discussion, like what's going on now at the University of North Carolina, while it's not a, uh, a position I would wish on any, anyone, sort of the discussions that they're having about the, the proper role of, of athletics and academics, I think they're having a healthy discussion, and that discussion should take place on their campus, and then a discussion should take place here. And what they decide to do, what Duke decides to do, what Memphis decides to do, and what Northeast Louisiana decides, they can all decide to do whatever they want. Like, we're talking sports here. And to me, the NCAA should be administering championships, and, and like, you have your standards, I'll have mine at my school, and if you want to play on, Sunday, on Saturday, well, I'll see you at 7 o'clock and we'll play. And then you go home and you educate your students the way you want, and I'll educate mine the way I want. And I think it would work out pretty well. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see there being major problems in that. Um, because, you know, nobody's saying, hey, wait a minute. Like, we shouldn't pay our coaches this much because of our chemistry department. You know, they're having those discussions on their campuses, and that's great. Uh, I don't think that's the role of a, of a governing body and of an industry, an entire industry, to say, okay, because we love chemistry so much, can't give Jabari Parker more than scholarship. That's where we draw the line, the players. It's not a shared burden in any way. It's the players' burden. You know, so now chemistry is on it. <laughs> it was a good question, but now chemistry is on the players. Yes, sir. Take the heat. I'm you are the NCAA. That's what I'm saying. But, but it seems 
But we're silent. The institutions themselves don't seem to be stepping out, and it's all the NCAA is doing all this stuff. I mean, well, but the, I, I think the the presidents of different institutions do do say different things. They do speak out at times. Uh, the the primary voice comes out of Indianapolis. Uh, the conference commissioners uh, have uh, have big voices, even though they are not members. The, the conference commissioners have no say in NCAA governance. They have no vote. But they have a tremendous amount of heft and power, a ton of power. Uh, Mike, if anybody thinks that Mike Slive and Jim Delaney, uh, the commissioners of the SEC and the Big Ten, respectively, aren't the two most powerful men in sports, the college sports, they need to re rethink it. They are. Um, so what you know, what do, what do the schools need to be doing? I mean, you know, these are all decisions that these individual institutions can make. Uh, I don't think it's anything for a governing body to be dealing with and for all of them to be, like I was at recently at a, uh, a conference for the faculty athletic reps and there, it was great. I mean, I learned a lot. I was so happy to be there and, and meet everybody. There was a discussion about um, students being able, student athletes being able to, and I have a hard time saying that term. I don't believe in the term student athlete. Um, I was a student in class. I was an athlete when I was playing. Student athlete meant nothing to me. Um, but there was a discussion about majors, that certain athletes couldn't take the major of their choice because practice interfered. And I was thinking for a while that, that we were headed down a road, the discussion was heading down a road where they were looking for a rule, a blanket rule that applied to everybody about you know practice times and majors. and. You guys deal with that on your campus. I think the faculty athletic reps are great. When they get together, they should get together and discuss best practices, what works at your school, and then go back to their schools and do it their way. We don't need a rule about what time practice is all over the country. We don't need that. We need a practice. We need a rule about 20 hours a week. Because if anybody thinks it's really 20 hours a week, they're crazy. <laughs> it's not 20 hours a week. And no matter what the sport, Revenue, non-revenue, the amount of time that puts that, that is put in is the same. They put in, you know, women's field hockey puts in the same amount of time and effort as football. I mean, they, they're, they're all professional in the way they go about it. Now, I don't know what we can do about the fact that women's field hockey is not valued in the marketplace the same way. I don't know what we can do about that. But, Should we do anything? No, not in my judgment. But, but... If, if we opened it up to the Olympic model and said, go get what you can in the marketplace, Missy Franklin would get more than some of the basketball players here. You know, I don't think that needs to be regulated. I think we can handle that just fine. Up front, yeah. I don't want to ignore the people up front. <laughs> it seems like some of the debate is sort of assuming that if we started to pay players, that means there would actually be some sort of drop in revenue and we'd have to start cutting things. I mean, these schools are rational actors, doesn't it? It's maybe a quantitative question that hasn't been studied extensively, but isn't the whole idea is that they would maximize the value to actually increase revenue that's coming out of some of these programs? Or how does that... Now these pesky economic theories are coming in that the NCAA doesn't want to deal with these pesky economists that come in with good points. Um, you're right, uh, and, and that's, that goes to the excuses that have been put forth, that if we provide, if we allow schools to provide more to the players than just a scholarship, then all the doomsday comes in, all these sports are going to go away, everybody will stop watching. Uh, which has always been a beauty to me that, that you know we watch because of the purity of college athletics and I you know we don't we, we watch for the games and they're great and and I, I don't mean this to sound crass or callous but I don't know what the guys over at Cameron are majoring in I don't know I'm not what I, I don't look at all that I'm sure they'll be fine you know Duke can handle all their majors and when I go to North Carolina I don't know what they're majoring in and I go to these games and I don't, that's not what I'm interested in. I want to know can they dribble, pass, and shoot. Now, if they were sitting here, I wouldn't care what position they played. I'd want to know what they were thinking and what they, you know, what are your ideas? What can you contribute to the discussion? So I, I guess I believe in the duality of man. Yes? Previously, I've heard you speak about, I think it was your nephew or something at Kentucky. Yeah. was an in-student government. It's a beauty, isn't it? And if nobody cares about the amateurism and the integrity of amateur student governments and they're being paid, why do people care so much about the amateurism and the purity and integrity of student athletes? I, I don't think the vast majority of people care that much. But they think they care. They think they care. 
Yeah, and the ones that, that do care are carrying forward what I consider to be like it's a gotcha mentality. And I'll, first, the uh, gentleman mentioned my nephew. My, my nephew just graduated from the University of Kentucky and uh, was on a, gov what was called, he was a governor scholar, so he got a, a full scholarship to, to go there as a, as a student. And same scholarship that a player would get, room board, tuition, books, and that. And got involved in student government, and he ran for student body president and won. And they paid him cash. Now, I haven't, I, I need to find out the exact amount, but my brother told me it was uh, $5,000, and then somebody else in the family told me, no, it was way more than that. All right, whatever it is, let's just keep the lowest amount, five, they, 5000 All right, I asked, I asked my nephew, like, you know, your uncle, your dad told me, your dad told me that, that you're getting paid. And he goes, oh, yeah. Well, what, how would they base your pay? He said, well, they took the amount of hours they thought I would work as president. They just applied the minimum wage to it, and they cut me a check. And so he got that. He got six tickets to every football and basketball game, uh, parking pass, uh, you name it. You know, got taken care of pretty well. So, and he's not an employee, which is always the, well, we're not going to make them employees. We pay for play. They're going to be employees. They don't have to be employees. But we can pay, we pay student journalists, we pay all kinds of people. Uh, my wife brought up that Natalie Portman went to, went to, an, went to Harvard, uh, and, you know, nobody kicked her out because she was that, the, the dirty professional, dirty professional actor. Uh, that, that contagion can't get into our amateur field. Um, and it's kind of my, my question about what do you call a professional athlete enrolled in a, in a college class? A student. Um, there may there may be even an athlete sitting among us that 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 is contaminating this process. That, you know, no 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 paid athlete sitting in here is going to diminish the, the the education or the opportunity for education of the person sitting next to them. It's not that big of a deal, uh, but we're making it a big deal. And the last thing is on on why do people object so much? I think it's the way it's always been. Uh, they provide more. They provide the excuses every bit and rationalizations every bit as much as the NCAA does, and and it's it's a thing about kind of the like the one and done issue. Okay, there have been one and dones here at Duke. All right, the one and dones at Duke to a Duke fan, some Duke fans. Let's say some Duke fans, and I think you've probably heard this is our one and dones are good kids that have had great students that have had a, an amazing opportunity they couldn't turn down. <laughs> Their one and done's are compromising the integrity of the enterprise. <laughs> you have a, you have compromised your integrity. You know, so one school's athlete that gets in trouble with the law is a good kid that made a mistake. Another kid, another school's kid that gets in trouble with the law is a bad kid. They ought to kick him out. You know, it's it's all situational ethics in my judgment, and I think we see a lot of that. And but I, I think that's pretty easy to cut through. But boy, you got to listen to a lot of that stuff, especially on Twitter. Why did you think um, getting paid made you not amateur? Oh, um, that's just the way the NCAA is funded over the threshold. Hey, no, but they allow people to be paid, just not yeah under the threshold. But it sounds to me like the uh, student the government employees or whatever can uh, go way over that threshold. Well, originally athletes were amateurs and could be paid a lot of money. Um, they just had to be gentlemen. Right? They, they couldn't use their hands to work. Um, They're trying to protect them from exploitation, which means somebody other than us making money off them. That's what exploitation is. And I think athletes are exploited. I think every college athlete, revenue, non-revenue, is exploited. And my definition of exploited is when somebody else is restricting you from benefiting, and they are benefiting off you at the same time, you are being exploited. Athletes are not mistreated. They are not mistreated, but they are exploited. Yes, sir, and with a hat in the back. Um, I've heard one approach to it that the biggest barrier to implementing paying players is that in order to avoid, um, you know, just something like the English Premier League, that there'd have to be way more revenue sharing among all the conferences and all the schools. You know, something more like the NFL, where the most valuable franchises aren't necessarily at an advantage because they share so much revenue. I mean, to what extent do you think it's the conference commissioners, you know, in their kind of fortresses that aren't willing, you know, it, I mean, it would inevitably make the, the administrators of the leagues get paid less. But to what extent do you think it's the conference, 
you know, commissioners and all the other administrators just kind of holding on to their portion, like their fortress in the whole pie. To what extent do I see the conference commissioners? Um, <laughs> repeat the part about the conference commissioners. To what extent do I see them what now? Like, to what extent do you think it's just um, Commissioner X saying, I've got my league. I oh, I see, I see. The, money that the I self made. interest of all. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it. The action problem. Basically. Yeah, I think a lot of it has. The uncertainty of all of this is is troubling. I mean, I, I like certainty. Um, you know, th th I can tell you that this discussion is not healthy for my job. Um, it would be easier if I just sat back and, and, and all of us didn't talk about this stuff and we just had the games and, and there was no conference. If there were no conference realignment, the media, the media companies like it a lot better um, because there's cost certainty involved with the structure that we had before. Anytime there's realignment, uh, the cost certainty changes. Um, you know, things are changing in every bit as much in the media world as they are in, in, in the college athletic world. With digital communications, everybody's watching games on their phones now. Cable TV is changing. I don't know all the all the different implications of it, but you know, everybody knows where their money is coming from right now. And and I I have been one of those that thought that once once we get this uh, championship, this football playoff done, and once some of these other deals are done, where the leagues are wrapped up longer term that that's when we're going to see some more movement because everybody then is going to know where their money's coming from and the next money grab is the NCAA tournament. You know, because a lot of, you know, some of this has to do with regulation. People feel over-regulated. They don't want to share money with, uh, with the, uh, the smaller conference schools that are telling them what to do because they're kind of outvoting the bigger schools on, on the stipend and things that they want to do. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts to this. I wish I knew all the right answers. I don't. Um, but, you know, the thing I worry about most, and it's not, I don't worry about any of, any of these consequences as much as I do, I would prefer that the NCAA doesn't have, isn't forced to do something. That the O'Bannon case doesn't force them to do it. I would, I would, or, or that, you know, schools breaking away, the top five conferences breaking away and forming their own thing doesn't force them into, you know, they're not forced into doing what I consider to be the right thing. Um, I would like to see it happen on 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 its own motion, rather than some lawsuit, you know, kind of dictating what's going to happen. But my sense is is is, and you know, we still haven't seen what the effects could be of a of of a player, the players getting together and doing something, because I just don't think it's it's as difficult as people seem to think, and as unthinkable of the players walking out that. These players aren't party to these multi, these multi-billion dollar media contracts. What if they walk? What are we going to do? Going to order them to play? Take away all their scholarships? What are we going to do? You know, they've got more they've got more power than they know right now, and the real leverage they have is whether they play. And at some point, you know, I think basketball is by far the easiest. And I made this I made this. Uh, Example, I gave this example uh, a little bit earlier somewhere here on campus that, you know, and I'm not advocating any of this, but I can see it, I can see it being an effective tool to make a point. What, what if the players at some of these schools like here that have a practice facility attached to the, their arena waited till game time, they walked out, they shook hands, and they said, let's go play in the practice facility. And they all walked over there, and the managers had it set up for them to play, scoreboards ready to go, and they say, hey, we're dressed and ready. You said the game's at 1 o'clock, we're here. And we'll, we'll play. Game can count. All the stats count. Let's go. Now, we're not party to your contract to play it in front of the cameras in there. Because remember, it's an avocation. We're just playing for fun. We think it'd be more fun in here. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, what would the, I don't know what I'd do if I were an athletic director or a coach. What would you do? Would you, would you order them to play? I mean, I don't know, I don't know what I'd do. Um, and it would make a pretty, pretty effective point. Now, they'd take some criticism. They'd take a lot of it. There'd be a lot of blowback. But it would be interesting. I mean, that, that APU thing they did, there was, I had no idea that was going on. Uh, it was, that was really interesting that the players would do that. Now, would they take it another step? I don't know, because so many of them are here for such a short time. Would they go, well, I just want to get out of here. Um, there, was a, there was a guy I interviewed recently 
who was a freshman, a big shot freshman basketball player, and asked him, you know, what he was looking forward to getting out of the year. And he said, I just want to enjoy my last year in school. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't mean anything by it. He's a great kid. Uh, but he, he, he's going to be a pro at the end of the year, and everybody knows it. And he said, I just really want to enjoy my last year of school. And, and for people like, like me who have been sort of brought up uh, in the old school way, that stood out. But but I bet you I bet you there weren't a lot of eighteen year olds going. Did you hear what he said? You know, they, they probably weren't. That probably didn't didn't get to their sensibilities like it did to, to, to older folks like me. Yes, sir. So um, with that in mind, you know, talking about I think that was Marcus Smart's quote. But um, what was what is your opinion then on a players' union for college athletes? What is my take on a players' union? Yeah. That'd be fine. I mean, they've got a, there's a players association now called the National Collegiate Players Association. It's run out of California by uh, a guy named Ramogi Huma, who, uh, who played uh, football at UCLA. And it's, uh, it's, not, it's not anything other than a, a place where players can, can uh, share some ideas and all that. I don't even know how many players are members. Uh, a lot of them are former players that are members. Um, really gain steam, that kind of thing, because, uh, you know, even the longest, you know, longest uh, career in college is five years now. Um, does that kind of thing gain steam? I don't know. I mean, I t I've told this story before. I was approached my senior year. There was a, a gentleman named Dick DeVenzio, went to school here, played basketball here, who was way ahead of his time on all these NCAA issues, that when we made the Final Four in 1986, he, he raised the possibility, would you guys think, what would you think about boycotting the Final Four? And it wasn't raised as a, you know, sort of a proposal. He was just, what would, what would your reaction to that be? And mine was, we'll do it next year. Um, you know, you don't really have an appetite for it at that, that stage. Um, uh, but you, know, you never know. I mean, I think a regular season game, you know, like, just like even though the issue was different when John Thompson walked out of a, a, a ball game, a Big East game years ago at Georgetown to protest uh, Prop 48, um, you know, it was a very effective protest. Now, could the players do that? I think they could, and I think it could be a very effective protest. Yes, that sir. would be a political act, not a union. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned the five super conferences. There's been some discussion of larger conferences splitting off 8,200 schools. Uh, there was an article last year in a national publication that said that those schools had a football playoff. They might keep an extra 800 to a billion dollars that's now going to other sources, uh, not benefiting the schools. Do you see a likelihood that, there, that it seems to be gaining momentum? Is there going to be a split off? And then could those schools pay their athletes a stipend, a reasonable amount, uh, which their academic, their student peers cannot? And I'll say this. I, I was recruited to play college football, and I got an academic scholarship. I got a lot more money back than my buddies that played football. I mean, it worked. You know, that's been true for three decades. You got a lot more money as, a, as an I academic got, I got, scholarship? I got more money. While they, and while they were at practice, I could also keep a part-time job. I was rolling in dough. And I got money back. My buddies who played football couldn't afford to buy a hamburger or go on a date in many cases. It was a long time ago before you were born, probably. But it's been true for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, if you know, the, 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 off and keep the money, can they solve some of these problems, at least for those 80 to 100 schools? Can they, can they, they, they whatever they're going to do, those football schools, uh, can they solve some of the issues that? seem to be not in need of a solution. That's the question is, 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 first of all, I mean, are these, are these issues that need a solution? You know, if we, if we give people, because, you know, when we start talking about compensation to athletes and getting their fair market value, we seem to think that that's going to cause all these fights and problems and issues. And, you know, we don't talk about other things that way. We don't, we don't talk about what are we going to do with playing time? Do we play everybody the same amount? I mean, what do we do? Do we allow the media to put them on magazines? How do we do that? You know, I don't think it would be that big of a deal. But, but the, the conferences, we're probably talking about 64 different schools. I'm not sure we'd get up to 80 or 100 um, because it's, this is football uh, driven. And even though there are a bunch of schools that play big time basketball, if you don't play big time football, you're not going to be in this, in this tier. I do think that the, the first step is going to be a different tier of Division I, where you've got this super tier where they get to do kind of what their resources allow them to do. Um, 
I don't think we're going, I don't think under any NCAA umbrella we're going to get in our lifetimes, or at least in my lifetime, a, uh, um, a st anything more than a stipend. I mean, you know, I, I think the Olympic model would be great, uh, kind of a, a great compromise between the free market and, and what we've got now. But I do believe that, that most administrators feel like, well, if we can get to the stipend, we can stop a lot of this talk. We can kind of stem a lot of this. And I do think it's practical more than it is principled. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being practical. Well, but I horror, think it's more practical. The horror stories in the Oklahoma State expose that's being unleashed upon us in recent weeks, it, it, you know, they're quoting kids that couldn't afford to eat. You know, why'd you take money? Well, I was hungry. And that's in the stipend would help solve some of that. Just well, it would help with, yeah, it would help with why did you, you know, why did you take money because I, you know, because I couldn't afford to pay for this or that. It would solve that. But if somebody's going to offer more than that, you're still yeah. going to take it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the idea that that we would stop players taking money, that the NCAA says is a bad thing, they would still do it. Um, you know, the, people have been doing that stuff forever, and and in my judgment, there's nothing wrong with it. But um, but in other people's, there, and I'm not suggesting that that you know you should go out willy nilly and violate the rules. But uh, you know, none of this would ever be discussed if the rules weren't violated. You know, it, it, I, I think I think there are, there are things like here's what I would what I would think would be really effective, uh, like in the Southeastern Conference. You know, this Johnny football stuff I think has been really interesting. He may not be the proper the the best poster boy for for you know athletes getting compensated, but you know it's okay for them to sell Texas A and M to sell him. Like, they, do you hear about they tried to sell him for 20, they did sell him for $20,000 at their kickoff event. So you could call the 12th Man Foundation, pay $20,000 and sit at his table. I tried to buy the table. I called and tried to buy the table. I was too late. I would have bought it and I would have gone too. Um, but they can do that. But if the kid takes something, he's a, he's a bad guy. And, you know, could you imagine what would happen if the SEC, if the SEC football team teams got together and said, look, so the Friday night before our Saturday game on, on X date, every team get together, we're going to have a, an autograph signing at the same location, and we're all going to have to be declared ineligible together at the same time. You, you think those games aren't going to be played on Saturday? I'd like to see that and see what would happen. I mean, that would be an, another effective protest. Um, now, if that's what they believe in, I do think a number of players do believe in that. Uh, and it's a it's a higher number of players than than you'd think, but you know you can't say like I wouldn't have said that when I was a player. You know, you're not going to upset your coach or you know they used to say when when we were in Adidas school back then at Duke and it's Nike now, but you know they used to say well uh, you can wear whatever shoe you want. That would be the story. You can wear whatever shoe you want. Like we were going to put another pair of shoes on when our you know our, our school and our coach expected us to wear the ones we were given. You know, that wasn't going to happen. You're not going to do that. Uh, but the players are a little more savvy now, and uh, and if they did want to protest, I think it could be pretty effective. Um, but they'd pay a price for it. I mean, there, there, there'd be a backlash on them. Well, <clears throat> I hate to cut this off, but we have a class coming in in five minutes. So uh, thank you all for coming, and please join me. Go off, hold on, hold on. you said Three years ago, I, I would have thought that was true. You think it's going to happen? I think this thing is wide open now. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, the Suns have made that their Warriors are going to make a Michael Housefield is going to play the Suns and the Suns are going to make a settlement over Jersey now. Really? Housefield's an idiot. I know. I mean, he really is a clown. Do you know he used to play those exploring games? Walter. Oh, Walter Bowen. Is that right? They wouldn't have smart to do that. But I'll tell you what, I'm not a pleasure. Yeah. With him, I'm not a regular. I didn't know if you guys should have seen my goal up over there. Right. On the other side. Oh, that's all right. I bring the same argument every day. People are jumping in pools. You don't want to open Pandora's box. No one knows what Pandora's box is, though. You're on the Golic side? I know, on your side. He's on the Golic side. You bring the same argument. Hey, how are you? Yeah, I retreated. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. Nice to meet you. Yes. Uh, thank you all.
Sure. sure. Well, it's eight. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I think someone else wanted to have a presence. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually